Kill OB Count Podcast with Damien Ross, founder and master instructor of the Self Defense Company. Mad scientist of tactical <laughs> firearms training. Uh, I've gotten to know Mike a little bit over the years through a mutual friend, Jeff Anderson. And, um, well, Mike, uh, give, uh, give our guys a little bit about your background and how you got into this stuff. Yeah, thanks for having me on. My and uh, the, there's a long story and a short story to how I got, got to where I, I'm doing what I'm doing today. The, right. the quick story is I had way too much fun and got way too many concussions and ended up my, uh, my eyes didn't track anymore. My balance was off and I was falling a lot. My hand-eye coordination was bad. And I had to figure out whether that was my new normal or if there was uh, something better ahead of me. So let me uh, let me just ask you, how'd you get those concussions? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, Like I said, fun, fun, stupid stuff. Uh, (laughs) Skiing into rocks at high speed, uh, doing nighttime trail running and uh, running into trees that were uh, leaning over the trail, (laughs) Uh, things, things like that. Uh, Playing rugby, playing flag football and going head to head too many times. And right. Right. So So, ironically I fought and I, well, it sounds funny. I, I didn't get any concussions that I remember fighting. Right. Of course. Um, None of us do. And, you know, as we're finding like with CTE, you know, you wonder, well, what I would be like if I did it. You know, if I didn't do all those things. Um, uh-huh. So how, I mean, so you got into this because of potentials, you know, f- for CTE issues. That's not the first thing I think about when I think about neuro- uh, neurological, I can't even say it, uh, recovery and regaining motor skills. I think one of the last things I think about is firearms training mainly because I would think I would want to get my balance and I want to get my physical shit together before I started, you know, playing around with handguns. So, and uh, firearms. So how did you, how did you discover this? Well, so I ended up working with a group of performance neurology specialist trainers. Uh, They had a, a, variety of backgrounds. Uh, Eric Cobb is the the founder of the group uh, Z Health Performance mm-hmm. that I that I worked with and they do okay. performance neurology and work a lot with uh, both ends of the spectrum. Right. So professional athletes, uh, world champions in basically the gamut of professional sports mm-hmm. and also stroke rehab and okay. TBI rehab. And they, they both have a lot of commonalities. And so what I found was when I took the drills that I was doing to get back to normal and used them with shooters, I would see as much improvement in their shooting ability in two to three minutes as a typical instructor could get in two to three days. Wow. Wow. So it was just a, a tremendous change. And what I came to realize is that all firearms training is built on a foundation of vision, balance, and hand-eye coordination. Okay. And right. if you build on a shaky foundation, you're, sure. you're limiting your upside and you're not going to improve as fast. If right. you have a solid foundation, you can get explosive gains and you can retain them longer. So let's look at the uh, traditional training model for firearms. So typically uh, you would, um, you know, get a lot of, you know, get a lot of rounds and go down to the range and start throwing lead down range. Yeah. Right? Brute, brute force, high volume training. Okay. So, um, you know, just so you, you know, the reason why, like we, we hooked up probably about uh Oh, gosh, we started talking uh, three or four weeks ago. And the reason why we're here now is because I actually wanted to go through the Praxis training. I read, uh, you know, I read the book, I've read your book, Real World Gunfighting, and there'll be a link to that in the description below uh, to get me started. And that brought me to the Praxis system. And I really wanted to, I 
really wanted to, um, uh, you know, understand what you know what you're doing from a practical perspective before I could kind of comment or participate in this podcast somewhat intelligently. Um, and I use that word very, very loosely. <laughs> the um, uh, one of the things right off the bat um, was I was cross-eyed dominant. And okay, yeah. that was um, something that I didn't even realize was an issue. So, and I fixed it um, because as uh, I don't know if, I, you know, a, you know, people from around the country, around the world be watching this uh, New Jersey, I, you know, my personal journey with firearms, I used to have a CCW uh, when I was a bodyguard, God, 20, almost 20 years ago. And um only had that for a couple of years because the New Jersey is provisional until now. So now I was going back to carry again. So now I have to start training like I'm going to carry. And mm -hmm. I started using your course um, to get me there. And yeah, I, you know, I qualified and all the other stuff and we're all good. We're just waiting for all the paperwork's in. Now I'm just waiting. So, you know, compare, um, I guess the, uh, traditional brute force style training to what you do and what most people who carry for a living should be doing um, as regards to how much dry fire training, how much force on force and how much range time typically, you know, people should be doing in their training. Yeah, that, uh, so that ratio, uh, I could throw out any number and it right. might be believable. Right. Uh, Fortunately, I had friends who, for three and a half years, they ran a stress shooting lab up in Minneapolis. Okay. And they ran uh, upwards of 140 classes per month for three and a half years. Wow. So a very high volume. And they tested a lot of things that people had assumed before, but had never tested. They had uh, special operations personnel from... Uh, Army, Navy, uh, Marines, AFSOC, and they had uh, SWAT captains as instructors. And each of them had their own best practices that were sure. definitely the best and definitely better than everybody else's. Right. And so they tested them. And they found a, a mix of things that uh, when you actually test stuff and actually keep good data, uh, what, what works the best? So one of the things was the ratio of training and what's the best ratio. And a lot of it depends on where you're at in your progression as a shooter. Mm -hmm. But the, the numbers that they found that were most effective for newer to intermediate shooters was 80% dry fire, 10% live fire, and 10% stress inoculation in the form of force on force or other drills that caused a stress response and put people in a position where they they had to work through their stress response. Wow. I mean, that is um, counter to what most people believe. Um, you know, most people, especially, uh, yeah, I would say even most shooters, um, it, it's all 100% range time. Yeah, there. and there's a few really big reasons why that's not the best thing to do. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest is uh, when, when we hold something 18 inches from our face that has an explosion and creates a pressure wave, mm -hmm. our brain does not like it. <laughs> right. And we have to constantly fight that aversion. Hmm every time we're doing live fire. Okay. So if right. you're going out and you're doing live fire with 22, you're probably not going to develop a lot of the problems that come even when shooting nine millimeter. Right. So, and, and, so, you know, what you're saying is that, you, you know, the, the problems that, you know, uh, caused you or brought you to, um, developing uh, this uh, system, the Praxis protocol, 
you know, actually, you know, you were causing, you know, you'd be causing the same type of damage from live fire. Well, there, there can be that component to it, depending okay. on how strong right. the concussive force is. But okay. one of the things is when our eye feels a concussive force, mm -hmm. uh, it, there is a flinch response. You think about uh, going to the eye doctor and right. getting a poof of air on your eye. Right. There's a, there's a natural aversion to that. So and, now, the, so you're saying that, and just, you know, walk me through this. So, you know, you're doing this live fire response, uh, live fire training, you're developing poor habits for actual gunfights? Yes. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And then there's flinching and what would be some of the, uh, what are some of the negative effects? So flinching is one of them. Okay. And another one is, uh, depending on where you're training, uh, you can train yourself to shoot way too slow because okay. that's all the range will allow. Correct. Uh, yes. Yes. A hundred percent. You may not be able to pick up your gun and shoot quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you may not be able to draw from a holster. Right. may not be able to transition, may not be able to engage multiple targets, right? And may not be able to practice shooting on the move or shooting while off balance. Right. And right. all of those are factors in real world gunfights. Right. I mean, so again, uh, we need to be safe. I mean, it's not that we should be doing this with uh, 10 other people on the line with live fire. Right. I, I'm not saying that it's it's that uh, we need to figure out how to if we've got a safety limitation, we need to figure out how to still do effective trading in spite of that safety limitation. Yeah, so still being safe and but plus getting the work done. People, it, it also gets expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, unless we're, uh, you know, we're government funded, we have unlimited rounds. You know, and plus the convenience of going, I mean, it, it works out in your, your favor. So, you know, you don't have to take that time to go to the range. I know you probably, I mean, it looks like you've got a setup on your property for mm -hmm. practice. You know, guys like me, uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough, our gun club is five minutes away. But before that happened, it was an, there was a three hour investment of time to get down to the nearest range get on and fire so it should be this comes as a relief it should come as a relief to a lot of people that you know you don't have to do that i mean like typically you know going through uh the practice protocol what's a typical practice time you recommend for people like during the week how many times a week how long things like that so what i've seen through thousands of shooters is that you can get exceptional gains in performance and retain them by only practicing five to 15 minutes at a time, a few times a week. Wow. And for a lot of people, that's about the same amount of time that they spend making their coffee. Right, exactly. It's funny because they, you know, when we get into our tactical training for close quarters for hand to hand, I mean, that's kind of where we're at with, how long you should be practicing because you know there there comes a drop off to in retention after a certain amount yep. of time correct yeah and that, you know that makes perfect sense because if people stop looking at firearms training as something that's on its own and look at it as a martial art or right. another physical skill that you want to be able to perform at a high level under stress Right. Training is the same. Yeah. It's just figuring out how do you apply all of these principles that we know work and that we know have worked for a thousand years, a couple thousand years yep. to firearms training instead yeah. of doing stuff new that doesn't work. I mean, we react under stress one way. Yep. The SNS kicks in and this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. And that's what I really enjoyed about going through, you know, about the book. Uh, real world gunfighting and of course eventually going through starting to go through the praxis protocol i mean there's a lot on there um as i'm working my way through it um really uh again fantastic stuff um one of the things though now as you you know 
probably heard now with the, as everybody's heard with the new two-way ruling about New York City, um, other states have filed suit. Uh, New Jersey is one of them. I've got, you know, personally, I'm waiting now all my paperwork's in. I've got all my claws done, uh, waiting to get my CCW. Uh, so there's a lot of new people, especially in our area, that are, you know, new to this. I mean, there's, you know, one thing that I do is I, you know, I really don't talk about what I do in my day job, even with my friends, unless I'm directly asked. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, because I, you know, I've got my opinions, everybody's got their opinions on, you know, the way this stuff, all this stuff is when it comes to firearms or self-defense and martial arts. I mean, it might as well be religion. Right. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. I mean, everybody's like right or wrong. I mean, there is, you know, I know what works for me. I know what I teach and I know, and I can give you a reason why I teach it. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong, even though obviously there's right and wrongs with everything, but this is why I do it. This is, you know, this is how I do it. And this is why I don't do the other thing you may be mentioning. So, you know, that being said, I've got a lot of new people out there, you know, um, what, um, so, what uh, would you, what are the, what mistakes new concealed carry, you know, permit holders make that they should avoid? You know, yeah, the, uh, one of the biggest things is gun selection. Okay. And there's a couple of different angles to that. One is people go out and get a gun that has great reviews mm -hmm. that may or may not be paid reviews right of course and don't actually put their hands on the gun and shoot it right most before they buy it. most of them most of them can't like we can't unless i unless i know somebody that has a weapon that i can go that i can go mess or that i can go uh try most of them are looking at feel and concealability yeah so, and now that's interesting because uh, a lot of ranges around the country mm -hmm. will have 10, 20, 30 rental guns right. that you can go and uh, either rent by a caliber. Mm -hmm. and so you can shoot any gun that's that caliber for mm -hmm. an hour and you just go shoot a few times, come back, go shoot a few times, come back and switch guns until you find stuff. Uh, Another is that uh, people don't know what they're looking for in a mm -hmm. firearm as far as how is it supposed to feel. Right. And so a lot of times he, the best gun for someone may be uncomfortable at first or the best grip or the best technique may be uncomfortable because it's not natural. Right. Well, if you don't have any skills, what's natural may not be good. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, another big issue that, that I see is people getting a gun that is too big of a caliber and too small of a gun. And okay. it can be a, a Scandium frame 357 mm -hmm. that just, I mean, I, I have one, I carry one. Mm -hmm. uh, I carry 38 special wad cutters in it. Right, right. And it's the, the absolute lightest load I can find. One, because I know the performance of the wad cutter. Mm -hmm. And two, because otherwise it hurts to shoot that thing. Right, right. There's nothing, right. There's nothing to it. Yeah. Sure. And some of the, the micro compact semi autos, yeah. even in nine millimeter. Uh, there are a lot of people who either have arthritis or injuries or mm -hmm. they're just small frame and their their day-to-day -day activities haven't provided them with a whole lot of grip strength right that they're not a good gun for them and so over the years i have switched a lot to recommending that newer shooters smaller shooters shooters that don't have a lot of grip strength mm -hmm. They go with a 22 revolver. Okay. 
And there's, it's been really interesting that that has gone from being something that has been demonized right. to something that uh, there's almost a groundswell of support for <laughs> among uh, serious shooters, guys who have been in gunfights, uh, been in gunfights over a period of several years and have gotten into retirement, are dealing with arthritis, are dealing with injuries, and they looked at the performance and they found the same thing that I did, that uh, unless you're going out and being tactical Timmy and needing to punch holes through cars and walls and everything else, right? Uh, 22 gets the job done and it gets it done quickly. The, the difference in recoil between dry fire and live fire is minimal. Okay. It's cheap to shoot and train with. Right. And there are just a, a ton of advantages. And people who have uh, lower grip strength who don't have a problem with it, newer shooters don't create the aversion to recoil mm -hmm. with it that they do with a larger caliber gun. Huh. And I don't know anyone who has too many 22s. So. No. I was Even just giving, I'll be honest, and Tom, uh, you're out there, I apologize. I've been giving my buddy shit because he just bought like a 22 revolver. <laughs> and I was one of those guys, man. Dude, I'm sorry. So, I mean, this is like, this is a revelation to me, um, being that I'm in the market to pick up a few more handguns. Um, so, you know, because obviously, you know, people get concerned with stopping power and you know all those arguments that you hear and why they look at the 22 like it's not going to do the job yeah so it, do you mind if we go down that rabbit trail oh, real quick? man this is why we got i got all day okay awesome <laughs> so if you if you look at stopping power of pistols right i love the, this okay go the yes. easiest thing to remember is that pistols suck for stopping threats Right. All pistols, all calibers that you would be willing to carry and shoot okay. suck for stopping threats. Now, let's. Now, why is that? Uh, there's just not enough energy. Okay. Uh, it's the, it's like, not a heavy the, enough bullet at a fast enough. A 45, a 357, mag, like any of these larger loads still is uh, a problem? Well, there's been some interesting studies. Uh, Greg Ellifritz did uh, a compilation of uh, uh, oh, shoot, I forget the classification of the shootings, but basically uh, all different calibers and how many hits it took to stop the threat. And it didn't matter the caliber. It took between two and three rounds. Okay, so it just mattered to get more, get more rounds on target. Yeah, and a 22 in a very small package is way way easier to shoot fast and accurately than a 38 special a 357 a nine millimeter a 40 45 any of those so it doesn't take as much training to get good right uh, it's easier to train a lot with them wow and under stress uh you can put five hits on target with a 22 in the time that it may that you may be able to get one or two on target with a 38 or a 357 or a nine wow wow and what kind of loads you carrying in the, in the 22 oh uh, right now the kind of the accepted leader as far as uh, self-defense performance is mm -hmm. the federal punch okay and yeah. it's got a um a profile it's kind of like a hard cast lead okay so it's made to it's not a hollow point it's made to just punch a hole wow yeah man that's big i'm glad i'm glad i asked you know because there's a lot yeah. uh, again there's i knew because uh, uh i knew that the reason why uh police departments went back to the nine millimeter from the 45 was for that reason they could get more on target and now Mm -hmm. that you know you're mentioning the 22 I'm like now I'm, yeah man i gotta i gotta look at my order <laughs> yeah now i would 
I wouldn't suggest an officer carry a 22 as their primary. Fair enough. Right. <laughs> right. But for a lot of people, if you if you need a very, very small package or you need something as a a first gun that is going to be fun to shoot and easy to shoot. Yeah. And not punish you, not punish your your face, not punish your hands. Right. And be forgiving. Uh, 22 is a great, great option. Because right now I'm looking at the Smith and Wesson 38 hammerless uh, J frame. Uh, yep. Great gun. Yeah. So that's on the list. But then it's also, you know, I've, you know, I've got my wife who's coming into new in the shooting. So that's something to think about because I was thinking of the Glock 43 or 43, you know, 43 X. Um, looking at the P uh, for my carry, I was looking for another carry. I was looking at the P365 XL. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm always open for suggestions. Like I said, like I'm always learning and, you know, you know, that new data comes out regularly. And if it makes sense to my common sense, you know, I'll, I'll listen to it, you know? So, you know, typically for first time CCWs, I mean, do you have specific, well, I know there's a lot of factors in there. So I guess, you know, what we talked about the criteria about, you know, what your grip strength is being, if it's a, I mean, it, so we say, if it's a smaller grip, you might not be able to hold it as well as if, you know, if it were a larger caliber, correct? Am I correct. Right? Absolutely. That? Yeah. So you'd actually want a larger grip with a larger caliber so you can, so you can handle it. Okay. And that makes sense. Um, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the things that people bitch about, but it's actually probably a really good thing that's happening because we should do it anyway is you have to in new jersey you need to qualify with every weapon you carry and you can carry up to three so mm -hmm. at least you would have to be proficient on some level you know as far as you know you know operating the weapon uh especially when you're you know hitting that target at 25 yards it you know it's not easy for me <laughs> i mean I, I hit it but you know um so uh yeah that's uh that's excellent uh to know about what about um you know what about uh you know you've got you know people coming in and now they're going to listen to this uh they're going to go um get the book and what are the what are like the top three drills that you have for dry fire training for new shooters especially that's a that's a good question because it, it, it so much of what a good drill is depends on where you're at as a shooter and if you pick a drill that's too challenging you're going to be rewarding randomness every time that you succeed okay and if you pick a drill that is so easy that you're nailing it 100% of the time, mm -hmm. you're not training anymore, you're performing. Okay. And when you're performing, uh, big, big chunks of the brain, namely the cerebellum, mm -hmm. shut down because the, the cerebellum right. activates based on error correction. Got it, right. And if you're doing something that's so easy that there's no error, cerebellum can check out. Huh. Right. Well, then it becomes instinct. Yeah. Which is what we want. But then at that point, you need to challenge yourself to get you out exactly. of that. Exactly. And then grow. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, this is the way, you know, this is the way all training, you know, on every skill at every level, you know, is to kind of shake you up out of your comfort zone. So when I would say like, how yeah. so you get a guy, he gets his, he gets his, his gun, you know, what are some of the things you can be doing, you know, like right away? Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, you no. In a different direction than I thought you were going to go. Okay. Sorry. You know, so I just want to bring it back to like, hey, man, you should, you know, do the, you know, hang the, you know, hang the paper on the wall, you know, and start, you know, drawing and extend, you know, like um, just like you do in the beginning of the praxis uh, protocols, just, you know, drawing and taking through the stages of drawing a weapon um videoing yourself uh 
mm-hmm. shooting, you know, seeing where you're pulling all, you know, pulling, I mean, things like that. Yeah. So I've got a, uh, a set of drills at uh, dot torture drill.com. Okay. And it's a, a eight and a half by 11 target that has a, a modified version of the dot torture drill. Okay. And it has a, um, a pattern on it that sucks your focus in and helps people shoot two to four times more accurately. Oh, that's cool. Very, very quickly. And it's set up uh, one of the issues. Well, let me back up a second. Sure, sure. Uh, if possible, you want to have an airsoft version of the gun that you're carrying. I'm and- a big fan of that. Yes, I do. And yes, cool. yes, everybody should. I recommend I yeah. said, I said that probably if I said that like four times this week. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yes. one of the challenges with airsoft when you're when you're doing drills at home is the accuracy of the gun. So you've got to be fairly close to be able to shoot tight groups with them. Right. Uh, talking one to two inch groups. Mm-hmm. And with airsoft, because of the fact that they use hop up and the projectile is so small at the six to 10 foot range, they're going to hit lower than where you're aiming, okay. uh, especially based on the, the temperature of the gas. Sure, so if you've been shooting right. a lot, it's going to be a little bit lower. Right. So what I did was I made a, an offset target. It's like a, a figure eight. So you aim at the top target and you score the bottom target and right. it's made for for using with airsoft huh. so you can score the bottom target if you're using airsoft score the top target if you're using a uh, laser or uh, conventional firearms so how did you come up with this <laughs> just ran into a problem so what it, we've got a uh, a warehouse where we uh, put together some of the packages for our training with my with my boys and right. they're uh, 12 and 15 Okay. And one of the things that we do is when they're done putting together packages, I'll let them shoot for money with airsoft. Nice. And so they get 10 shots at a one inch circle. Wow. And however many hits they get, they get that many dollars. Nice. And the, the issue is I was teaching them to hold higher than where they wanted to hit. Okay. And that doesn't transfer over to the real world. No, uh, in the real world, you, you want to be able to put the sights or the dot where you want the bullet to go right. and be happy with the results right. out to, I mean, within reasonable distances. Sure. And so I was like, all right, how, how do we make this work? I don't want to teach them to aim high. I don't right. want to teach them to angle the gun or do anything funky that only applies to airsoft at this range. Right. And so I made the offset target. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, man. I said, like, you know, you probably are going to be getting, um, you, you have to be seeing, you will be seeing some influx from definitely New Jersey, probably most likely my town. (laughs) (laughs) People looking for stuff, you know, I, I can't stress enough, you know, the importance of what you're doing, because again, you know, even, I like it is from a training perspective because you're you're bringing uh, you're allowing people to bring the firearm into their home and into their lives. My biggest problem with uh, self defense training was that you always had to kind of go to it, right? Yep. So it's like I go I go to the dojo, I go to the gym, I go to this guy, I go to that guy. But when when the reality is, you know, you're going to get a, you know you may likely be attacked in your home you know, where you, you know, where you live, where you work. Right. So, you know, once you start bringing these things into where you live, now you're starting to associate, you know, using these tools and these skills outside of the training area. So I love, you know, using your stuff in my house, uh, in my barn, um, just, it, it allows me to, to really personalize it. And I think that's, you know, something that is uh, really, really overlooked, especially now that, you know, a lot of new people, like there were like something like 
2021, I think it was almost like 10 million new people purchased firearms for the first time. Yeah. You know, uh, now that uh, the two A the Supreme Court overturned the uh, the decision, now there's going to be a lot more two uh, A uh, people, you know, car- people carrying uh, every day. So, you know, it's it, they're new to it, especially if you don't grow up around guns. You know, in New Jersey, I mean, we had to go find them, right? Literally, you know, it wasn't like you know we we're working the ranch or you know, my uncle's got, got, you know, my dad's got a gun or, you know, it just wasn't, it just wasn't accessible to us. So now it is. And I think, you know, what you're offering is for our area is, um, you know, it's uh, the timing is, is great. Um, and yeah, it's extremely, extremely, extremely important. Um, so yeah, man, uh, Anything else? I mean, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna send people uh, to uh, the gun uh, to real world uh, gunfight training. We're also gonna put the the link to torturedrill.com in the description. Um, Say, so yeah, man, uh, it was good to. Uh, it was awesome to have you. Um, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do this again uh, soon when we get some more stuff going on, but. You know, anything else you want to mention anybody uh, before we uh, before we shut down? No, that's awesome, Damien. Thank you so much for for having me on and uh, glad that uh, the book and practice are helping you get get back up to speed. So I'll tell you what, you know, you know, the idea of keeping my, you know, both eyes open, you know, as far as, like, you know, keeping my, you know, field of view wide you know, especially when you're under stress and that tunnel vision kicks in, um, you know, that was uh, literally an eye opener. <laughs> um, so, and I did, you know, qualify with both eyes open, which was good. And um, yeah, man, I got you to thank for it. So uh, again, thanks, man. Well, thank you very much, Damien. Okay, everybody. Uh, again, uh, hit the links for uh, Mike stuff below. And uh, until next time, Train honestly. Cool. Awesome. All right, man. So yeah, dude. Um, we'll put this out. I'll let you know when we're gonna we're gonna uh, put it out to everybody. Probably in about a week and a half. Um, okay. It'll go on YouTube. It'll put it out to list and all the other shit we got going on. But yeah, man. I gotta tell you, like I've been going through the training. There's a lot there. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I'm trying to, you know, just eat little pieces of the elephant. Yeah, well, I mean, you're.